Thank you very much. Pleased to be here to talk to you all. And thanks also to, of course, the Big Screen Symposium. In the late 90s, I lived for a couple of years in Los Angeles. And believe me, screenwriting books were in every bookstore en route to being in every apartment. And everyone wanted the Midas touch and to write Martin Scorsese's next picture and to eventually be able to deliver master classes on a lucrative master class circuit. <laughs> These books were everywhere, and I remember one in particular. It was real popular. The 90-day screenplay. A bestseller when it came out, an absolute Bible for many, as it gave every taxi driver and busboy and secretary the sense that the big time was close at hand. How close? Well, 90 days and 15 bucks away. But this book's days at the top of the non-fiction bestseller list were numbered. A new Bible was soon to appear and the 90-day screenplay was duly knocked off its perch by a sensational new bestseller, How to Write a Movie in 21 Days. <laughs> Clearly, the latter was a superior book by some margin. I mean, same result, 61 days less time. And a publishing pattern was duly established. Soon we had Darren Donnelly and his brother Travis stepping up to the plate. Dan and Trav's book was called The Ten Day Screenplay. <laughs> Apparently Dar and Trav had found a way to write and write fast and cause to be written nine feature films of similar or better quality than their predecessors in the exact same time that the 90-day screenplay could only produce one. <laughs> Things were heating up, ladies and gentlemen, and begging the question, would records continue to be broken? As the history of the 100 meters has shown, we have not yet reached the maximum at speed at which screenplays can be written, but there is, of course, a terminal velocity the fastest speed at which you can possibly type. The ultimate title may, may well be the 80 words a minute screenplay. <laughs> speed aside, all these books have something in common. They tell the same story. They've identified key qualities that many commercially successful screenplays share. They have codified a language that has been adopted by creative executives in both film and television. In my experience, these books will not hurt you. They are not harmful to writers. They are only harmful to producers and to funders. Why? Because books like this provide producers and funders a template and a vocabulary by which to measure and critique screenplays to allow them to say where and how they don't conform to certain moot rules. The executives hate uninsurable ideas they find too risky all proposals that have no successful precursors. This has resulted in a landscape where you will always, always be asked to define your story in terms of a classic three-act structure. Because it's then that they feel they have their best shot at evaluating, evaluating its potential. Footnote one, they will never ask you to present it as a five-act structure because no one actually knows what that is. So to survive in the film business, the TV business, it's necessary to understand the pressures producers and financiers operate under. As such, you have to know what a three-act structure is. Fortunately, it's pretty simple, reason perhaps for its broad appeal, and here it is. Act one, the shit hits the fan. Act two, part A, the hero has no choice but to act. Midpoint, realization of initial goal, but first appearance of greater goal. Act two, part B, even more shit hits the fan, ending in a river of shit in which the hero is submerged, otherwise known as the lowest point. Act three, with the clock ticking and the hero digging deep, the river is drained, the fan is cleaned, the hero reaching a higher state of maturity and reconciliation. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, a mold. A famously successful mold into which you can now pour your slurry of words. <laughs> and when it sets, you will have a screenplay. It will at least look like a screenplay, read like a screenplay, conform to the expectations of a screenplay, and may possibly be saleable as a screenplay. But is it any good? 
Does it have anything fresh and new to say? And does it employ exciting new ways to say it? Well, those are other questions entirely, and the only ones we should spend any time discussing. Now, one of the things about preparing to give this talk is that I've, it's forced me to think about how I do what I do, something I've never before felt inclined to do, and I honestly don't know where I am in my own personal climb, but till now I've never looked down, never taken stock. So when I began to consider what I might talk about today, I first asked myself, well, where the hell am I right now? The answer without false modesty, I think, is that wherever I am, it feels like a good place, and by most systems of measure, it's better than ever. A place where I at least feel I am able to take on more and achieve more than I ever have before. Fewer things intimidate me, and the rejections, which never stop, by the way, are fewer and less impactful, while the times when I'm told I've knocked it out of the ballpark have increased. So maybe, maybe I've gotten a little better at what I do. And if I can afford to let myself think that, then it begs a big question. Okay then, bright guy, what has changed? How did you get better, and is the answer useful to anyone else? Well, we're about to find out. The facts are that I'm currently working on five major feature films, current, concurrently with some of the biggest film companies and some of the best directors in the world, and I'm finding that I can handle it. I'm required to jump between these projects and on, any, on any given hour, on any given day, and I find I can handle it. And the pressure of expectation at this point is considerable, but I'm handling it. And 20 years ago, for sure, I would not have been able to handle it. No chance. So what changed? What makes the me of now any more capable than the me of yesteryear? Is there any difference? Why am I now able to handle what hitherto would have overwhelmed me? My attempt to answer this question is your fault. Big screen symposium. <laughs> you started this, don't blame me. Okay, then let's go. Now there's much mystery surrounding the craft of screenwriting. So with so many different theories out there about how it's done, that our industry has felt it necessary to nail down a few basic rules golden rules, and I want to quickly mention some of the big ones. But let me add a caveat first. If these rules were any good, then simply by following the rules you would perforce end up with a superb end product. But the fact is this, these rules are, are only work sometimes. I've had now some 30 years trying to make films and almost everything I will say today can be just as convincingly contradicted. When I make a definitive statement, bear in mind the opposite can also be true. For instance, strong arguments could be made for the following heresies. One, write what you don't know so that your personal journey is an exploration. Instead, write what you want to know. Did Shakespeare visit Venice? Did Jules Verne go to the moon and back? Number two, tell it, don't show it. Sometimes it's better to hear about it than to see it. What comes out of a human mouth can have more emotional value than any toppling skyscraper. When the lovers kiss, maybe fade to black. Number three, never let your characters tell you where the story should go. You're paid to be in charge. Your characters are your slaves, no more. Order them around brutally. They may not be animals, but to paraphrase Alfred Hitchcock, they should be treated as animals. <laughs> Number four, structure is nothing. It is, as T.S. Eliot once put it, just the meat you throw the guard dogs so you can get inside the building and rip the joint off. <laughs> 2001 A Space Odyssey is one of the greatest films ever made, partly because its structure is indiscernible, a vacation from narrative. So now we have heard from the rebels, the contrarians, we can move on and discuss iron cast principles that I've found are useful sometimes, but not always. Powerful truths that have worked on some occasions and not others. Golden rules that have once or twice paid dividends. For those needing certainties, I give you the exits. 
So how do you write a screenplay so good that people will invest millions of dollars to see it made and millions of people will shell out to go and see it? Evaluating the potential of your idea. Imagine this situation. You have a concept for a film, a pitch you hope to sell. You go into a room and want to convince money-minded executives that your idea is going to make them A, a lot of money, or B, make them no money and possibly lose some, but will generate significant kudos and awards attention for them to, so that they may feel better in their old age. You are invited to speak, to present your idea, no matter how well you do it, and pitching is a science in itself, which we won't have time to go into now. You are asking these people to make an enormous leap of faith. It's as if you were trying to sell someone a car when all you have are a few of the car's parts lying out on the front lawn. You are, in effect, telling them that there's more where that came from. <laughs> to their valid question about whether your proposed motor vehicle will work, you reply, oh, absolutely. <laughs> what will be the range and speed of this car, they ask. Uh, well, we have to make it first, but uh, we plan to ensure that it will be a miracle of economy and performance, quite unlike any other car previously produced. <laughs> when then asked to offer more proof for this assertion, you struggle to provide it, maybe just saying, well, you'll have to trust me. I'm describing it this way because I think it's useful to put yourself in the producer fund funder's shoes. It's very hard to evaluate what will work and what won't work and why these executives are desperate to fall back on some system of evaluation. This is why producers and funders set so much store in the power of your premise. If your film has a seductive premise, you have your best shot at winning, at winning them over, even the most risk-averse producer or funder. The premise is often called the elevator pitch or the car park pitch. It's the reductio absurdum of your complex, deeply nuanced idea into a vulgar soundbite. My last film took 10 years to finance, even though it was about one of the most recognizable and brilliant men in the world. Why? Because my elevator pitch sucked. Quadriplegic gets cuckolded and so writes a book merging Einsteinian relativity with quantum mechanics. You fund it. <laughs> you can just see the film company boss, right? Glazing over, adjusting her glasses on her nose, glancing at her watch with zero discretion, and then asking, what else you got? <laughs> By far the most determining factor in a script being good, or better still great, which is what we want, and by far the most decisive factor in getting it made is the quality of your original concept. From this, even the dimmest financier, financier will be able to weigh its commercial viability. It is a truism that if you have a million dollar idea, you don't have to be a very good writer to write a saleable script, get the film made, or even be successful. But if you have a mediocre or weak idea for a film, your name could be William Shakespeare, and you won't be able to get it off the ground unless you're hanging out with Bill Gates. When I was 25 years old, I wrote with a friend of mine a stage play in three weeks or so. My buddy Stephen came over and he said, hey, why don't we write a play about male strippers? I think he'd been drinking. And I said, gee, I'm not sure I know much about male strippers, but how about we write a play about some regular guys who think it'll be easy to be male strippers? So we did that. A good idea is a good idea and can prove impervious even to slapdash craftsmanship. In fact, this particular idea was so good it just sailed away and became New Zealand's most commercially successful play of all time and continues to play around the world 25 years later. So why did it take off? It was a good idea and universally appealing. I tried many other times to find another one just like it. Believe me, not so easy. Great ideas are rare birds, you see. And you need binoculars, and you need to keep real quiet. And you need to know what you're looking for. So where do great ideas come from? I hear you asking. Where do you find great stories with strong premises? A, in your own personal story, in the nation's history and culture, in your community, in other cultures, in other stories that have gone before, in your imagination entirely, or all of it, all the above. My advice is, the only advice is, look everywhere, inside and out, and look all the time. Part of being a professional is never being off duty. The hours are lousy, but it's seldom boring. Learn to notice. 
with any luck you'll come up with one or two or three really great ideas in your lifetime. Most writers would settle for one. The rest of the time you're trying to make, your, make the mediocre ones work. <laughs> Laughter of recognition. <laughs> um, don't beat yourself up about this, we're all in the same lousy boat. Great ideas are rare. And here's something else. A great idea isn't ever delivered to you whole, all the elements in the right place. At least I've never been gifted one. Great ideas are made by you. The germ of a great idea isn't a film until you've cracked the story. The internal engine of the story has to be made to work. Reality is messy and the writer's job is to lick it into shape. Sometimes you can see how to do this from the off. These are the best projects. You can see right away how the idea might be turned into a story that can work and you have to know what to look for. And here's what I look for in order of importance. Number one, a story in which I can already foresee before I've written a single word, most of the major twists and turns in that journey. Number two, characters who I can't wait to gain control of, to make them do as I bid, <laughs> say things that are at the extreme end of the sayable, that are not ordinary or even acceptable behavior. Number three, a bittersweet ending. I believe perfect bliss is the preserve of cats, small children, drunks, and idiots. Importantly for me, I need the sense of an ending before I can begin, for only then will I know how to tell the story in the right way. Plan your story. If this sounds unromantic, screenwriters are not tasked to be poets. You can and should keep a certain analytical distance from your work. Number four, finally, a story with dimension, with some cultural importance or personal significance, a story that contains issues I am burning to examine and which will take me into some extreme of human experience. The prospect of telling the story must stir you to great excitement and this excitement will be tested and will diminish as you struggle with the telling. So make sure you have a huge reserve of, of excitement before you begin. Let me briefly expand on a couple of these points. Number one. No one knows where good ideas come from. If we did, we'd all go there more often. But we can agree at least that they are around us all the time and the task is to notice them. Number two, now as I say, a great idea isn't ever delivered to you whole. The story has to be cracked and Hollywood producers will pay a great deal of money to a writer if they can crack a story. Work out how to tell it in a compelling way. The internal engine of the story has to be made to work. Sometimes you can see how to do this from the off. They are the best projects. You can see right away how the idea might be turned into a story that can work. Number three, character. In a fiction, a person's character is their fate. So know the fate. Where this character has to end up in your story. And then select the character's traits appropriate to that fate. In a non-fiction project, however, you don't have such flexibility, but you can still make them do and say what you need them to do and say in order to honor the film's themes. Number four, humor. I personally always look for some element of humor. To me, no story, it, if, it is, if it is to make a claim at being true to life, can be devoid of humor. Almost every meaningful human interaction you will ever have will include some attempt, at least, at humor. It is the standard currency of conversation and how human beings do business. Humor is part of the ritual of negotiation. So if you want your stories to feel real and truthful, don't forget about humor. Number four, know your ending before you begin. For me, I never feel I have a grip on a story until I know the destination or at least have a sense of it. In fact, I never take on a project unless I know the ending and I'm convinced it's a powerful one. Not all writers agree with this. Many writers write freestyle, spontaneously, making it up as they go along, with no idea where the story's going. They say this is what makes the process feel exciting and artful, almost spiritual, the next step being the, the only important one. But I have found that those writers who are most vocal about their opposition to structure and formula and planning are invariably crap at structure and formula and planning. <laughs> Harold Pinter never planned any of his plays. Yes, well, it shows. 
I love his plays, but it shows. The plays are indisputably great masterpieces, but the endings suck. And in a movie, a weak ending is a deal breaker. With endings being so important in movies, it's what the audience takes away. It's a very brave writer indeed, and a very brave producer who will spend years on a project where the ending is the weakest part of the screenplay. I sometimes feel I need to know what my ending is first, because I just don't, don't have the guts to go through all the weeks and months of uncertainty and doubt and self-hatred and personal loathing tied up with not knowing where the hell I'm going. And it's true, writers who write without a plan with, will all tell you the same thing. Halfway through the writing process, the misery starts. Major perturbation. As the original impulse weakens, as a mess develops in the middle, as problems pop up, improbabilities, forced transitions. This way of working always gets the writer down. It's migraine-inducing, anxiety-spawning. Simply, the freestyle writer will suffer much more than the structuralist. And I began as a freestyler, a poet who believed his intuitions would carry him to victory, so I'm speaking from experience. I learned eventually that lack of planning will always catch up with you, that God will not always provide. Let me give you an example of a perfect ending, one that could only have been achieved by a structuralist, an author knowing exactly where she was going before picking up her pen. And here it is. There was a young man from Hibernia who rhymed himself into a hernia. He became quite adept at rhyming except for the odd anticlimax. <laughs> this is a perfect example for two reasons. The final line was known before the first line was written. It was the reason the poem was written, and it dictated the preceding lines. Secondly, and ironically, while being about an anticlimax, it's anything but an anticlimax. It's the perfect climax because it delivers satisfaction in a way we were tricked into not being able to foresee. The rhyme pattern promised us a final line that would rhyme with Hibernia. And then the author detonated this expectation. And delightfully, the author had something even better up her sleeve. Know your ending. Know your ending. I personally never decide to work on a project unless I know the ending and know that it satisfies my own personal criteria for a good and worthwhile climax. Okay, so let's say you had an idea for an interesting premise and you've come up with a really satisfying endpoint that delivers in an unexpected way on the potentials of that premise. How do you write the 100 or so pages in between? Well, you reverse engineer your story. What do I mean by reverse engineer? I mean that the ending will dictate almost everything you need to know about the story that precedes it. Character, plot, theme and structure. Example, if your film is about a talented pig, stick with this because it's brilliant, <laughs> a pig who wants to run faster than any pig has ever run before, and you have foreseen the ending, and foreseen it involving Porky winning the one, 100 meters at the Olympics, then the task is to instill in the audience for the preceding 100 minutes a subconscious craving to see a pig, its arms and legs pumping, hurtling down the track to victory. But it is a victory the audience has tricked the audience, uh, that the author has tricked the audience into not being able to foresee. For if at any point it's too evident to the audience that bovine gold is where the story is headed, then no swine on a dais will save you. If they can see it coming, and they will hate you for it. We can call this sleight of hand concealment of true intentions. The film at the outset must, one way or the other, ask a question that your secret ending will answer, but not in the way they had expected it to be answered. He became quite adept at rhyming except Thank you for the, uh, for the odd anticlimax. <laughs> On the point that your ending contains the clues you need for how to write the preceding 100 pages, here are two examples. Imagine a, cli a climactic scene that occurs on top of the Eiffel Tower. This may make you decide to create a character who in the first act suffers from vertigo, 
If the character has vertigo, this may then oblige scenes to explain why the character suffers from vertigo. The writer's job is to earn the emotion they wish the audience to feel. And you earn it by setting it up in a way that ensures the biggest payoff. Take The Deer Hunter, one of the greatest films. It's a masterpiece of reverse engineering. The ending involves De Niro in Saigon playing Russian roulette with another man in order to save his life. To make us care about the outcome and to make it powerful, the writers decided to make the two men spiritual brothers, make them familiar with gunplay, and go further, make them brothers pledged to look after each other no matter what. How about even making them in love with the same woman so that maybe if one of them dies, it simplifies their love life. And then the gun goes off, and then one of them dies and our hearts break. But not because the gun went off, not at all. If the film had begun with that scene, we wouldn't have cared. But because of all the scenes in between we have seen in the previous two hours, we think of the pledge, the woman at home, their families back home, their lost simple dreams. In short, know your ending. Something else I learned along the way, which rises logically from this example. If there are problems in your third act, the real problem is probably in your first and second act. It is not the ending that isn't satisfying, it's your setup. The ending is fine. It's probably why you wrote the script in the first place or should have done. But you can't believe your great ending isn't working for people. The gun went off. Why is no one crying? Answer, you didn't create the right set of preconditions that would establish audience anticipation for your obligatory and unpredictable ending. That sentence will sound like total gibberish, but it actually isn't, so I'll say it again. If there are problems in your third act, the real problem is in the first act. You just didn't create the right set of preconditions that would establish audience anticipation for your obligatory but unpredictable ending. Your Eiffel Tower climax isn't satisfying because you omitted to give your hero vertigo in the first act. If your climax involves a reconciliation and the reconciliation isn't satisfying, it's because the earlier conflict wasn't deep enough so that it made us ache for reconciliation. Make us ache for your wonderful ending, but be unable to see it coming. My personal list of favorite screenwriters are all reverse engineers. Retrofitters extraordinaire. Robert Bolt, Alfred Hitchcock, Billy Wilder, the Coen brothers, Woody Allen, Paddy Chayefsky. And my favorite screenplays all show the fingerprints of the writer knowing their ending first and writing toward it in the most elegant and satisfying way. Lawrence of Arabia, Godfathers 1 and 2, Jean de Fleuret, Raging Bull, Casablanca, Once Upon a Time in America, All the President's Men, Star Wars. Now you don't just have to work this way, and many people don't, it's just the best ones do. <laughs> you, you may plan nothing and just get lucky with your ending, it happens. My favorite low budget New Zealand film, Smash Palace, was a film where the filmmakers didn't have a clue how to end it. Its director, Roger Donaldson, told me one day that during the writing process, he and his co-writer, Peter Hansard, didn't have an ending, and they were stumped. Their lead actor, Bruno Lawrence, came by to check on progress and was so dismayed by the possibility that the film would die for lack of an ending that he promptly fell asleep on the couch while the director and producer continued into the wee hours to bang their heads against the wall. Apparently what happened was that eventually Bruno woke up and in a moment of delirious inspiration envisaged a car on a railway line, his character, a cuckolded husband holding a sawn off to the head of his wife's lover as a speeding train hurtles toward them, their mutual destruction certain, a quite good ending in itself if pretty dark, until at last minute the train forks away, something the husband knew would happen, not harming the car or the now laughing Bruno Lawrence, but scaring the shit out of the, the guilt-wracked lover, roll end credits. They had their ending. It delivered on the promise of the film and that Bruno was by then firmly established as crazy enough to kill himself and the wife's lover. And this made us think death would be our ending, but it shows us instead a man who wants to stay alive so he can be a better father to his daughter while giving, us the, lover, while giving the lover the biggest scare of his life. It is, I think, a perfect ending. But unless you have a Bruno Lawrence lying on your couch at 3 a.m., I would caution against this approach. Create a keen anticipation for an ending we can't foresee. I want to switch now to the issue of how to make yourself a better writer no matter what your story is. How do you make yourself fundamentally better at what you do? There is a simple answer, and it's this. Make yourself talented.
I should probably close it right there. A bit. <laughs> Talent isn't something you either have or don't have. Talent is acquired, it is one. It is the result of hard work and more hard work. Only then will you become talented. Some acquire it early during childhood as, an, as a natural extension of a sustained period of mental engagement. Others develop it later, become talented after the age of 50, when a perhaps dormant interest is suddenly reawakened. My friends, practice creates mastery, and repeated exercise of that mastery is what I call real talent. It doesn't come with your mother's milk or by going, on an expensive, going to an expensive school. It's inside you waiting to come out if you have the guts to draw it out. Over time, if you work hard enough, you can set free capacities inside yourself that you may not currently imagine you have. So what is it? What is the exact process by which this can be achieved? Can anyone become talented? When I started writing in my 20s, I developed through my interest in language a certain aptitude and sensitivity for language. But I was by no one's estimation, and certainly not my own, talented. These days, not even my harshest critics would say I'm, an, I'm entirely devoid of talent. So what happened? Talent is meant to be like your hair color. You can fake it being a brunette, but sooner or later everyone's going to find out the truth. When I assess myself, I can say without blushing that I am better now at what I do than I used to be. So how did this happen? What made the difference? What, what, what was the change agent at work? Was it simply a factor of age and becoming more worldly wise? or something even more mysterious. Well, I have a theory about this and it's even supported now by science, so I'll share it with you because it's pretty good news for all of us. Neuroscientists have only recently been looking at the matter of aptitude and some very recent studies have come up with some pretty spectacular findings. One study focused on 2,000 black cab drivers in London. London is not laid out like a grid. It's an impossibly huge maze, but for black cab drivers, in order to get their license, are forced to know every single street by heart. It takes them years to learn every street and to remember it. And what researchers found, to their amazement, is that cabbies have grown a significantly larger hippocampus than the ordinary person. The hippocampus is the brain, in the brain controls spatial awareness, and it turns out that the brain mass of cabbies grew to meet the extraordinary demands being placed upon their memories every day. And we can apply this example to screenwriting. To become adept at screenwriting, the only way, the only way to gain mastery is not by buying Darren and Travis Donnelly's ridiculous book, but by making huge and sustained demands upon the networks of your brain that govern creativity. Now, were I to write a book on this subject and stuff it into every LA bookstore, it'd be laughed out of town for what would we call it? Screenwriting made hard. Give me 10 years, I'll make you a star. Uh, but actually, I think this is the closest we've come to a true understanding of what it takes to get real good at all extremely complex and difficult tasks. I'm sure we all grew up being aware of the old right brain, left brain model. Right brain people work in banks and know what a square root is. Left brain people drink Beaujolais and discuss Kierkegaard and are a little bit of feet. But it turns out this is wrong. Instead, the truth is, as it often is, is much more interesting. We now know that creativity, the entire creative process, from preparation to incubation to illumination to verification, consists of many interacting cognitive processes, conscious and unconscious, as well as involving emotions, all operating in a vast network that reconfigure depending on what stage of the creative process you're engaged in. For instance, Every time you're trying to figure out how to work spatially, such as trying to work out the structure of your screenplay, you will be using the same part of the brain, the dorsal attention visuospatial network that we use when we try to fit luggage into the trunk of your car when you're going on holiday. Or if you're trying to write a lyrical passage, a climactic speech at the end of your film, where the sound of each word is vital, then you will make greater demands on the language network in the broker area. When jazz musicians and rappers engage in creative improvisation while in the flow state, they will call upon the imagination and executive attention networks. Writers, however, who can't afford such uninhibited freedom must bring into play their salience network to critically evaluate what they're doing.
So it seems, and this is the bad news for Travis and Darren, if you want to become really talented as a creative person, then you will need to develop these large-scale brain networks. And we are talking about training and literally growing the brain to match the task, all in an apprenticeship of years. No nine-day shortcuts. What this means is that wannabe screenwriters with an interest in being talented can be, but these screenwriters will need to write one script, then another, then another, and another, until their minds are bursting like a London cabbie driving mad by trying to remember every twist and turn in the, in the journey from Kensington Church Street to Wimbledon Common. And by the way, this information used to be well known. This level of devotion and concentration was actually standard in the artistic academies of previous centuries. In pockets, this ethos is still understood. The Florence Academy of Fine Art maintains the old master's standards to this day. Their website for their five-year apprenticeship, check it out, has this statement. As individual artists are challenged to push their technical ability beyond their perceived capacity, they will develop strength of character and the confidence necessary to become a professional painter. This work will help them create a state of mind in which they are certain of their choices. Our graduates will never stand in front of a blank canvas and feel lost. They will always be able to return to the method. They will never say, how am I going to do this? And will rather concentrate on what they want to say and follow their inspiration. I will finish now with a short description of the journey I went on on my last film, The Theory of Everything. The origin of the idea was simply that I had been aware of Stephen Hawking like the rest of us since the 80s and then I read Jane Hawking's autobiography um, and uh, made a beat a path to her door and begged her for the screen rights to make this film. Um, it was an extraordinary film in many ways, an extraordinary love story at the heart of it, but also was asking the biggest questions about the origins of the universe. The 27-year marriage had to be reduced, however, to the traffic of two hours on screen. And the question for the screenwriter was, what do you leave in and what do you leave out? I decided that the film should chart the life of the marriage and no more, tell a love story that would serve as a metaphor for Stephen's work in physics. A film then about the physics of love, not just the love of physics. Number two, that the unifying principle of the film would be time. And the film should end by time going in reverse. Because so much of Stephen's work involved winding back the clock to see what happened at the birth of time itself. So we have a little clip for you, which is, I think, fitting. So uh, know, knowing that ending informed so much of the writing, having decided that the governing principle of the movie would be time itself, I was able to put a post-it note on the computer and just wrote the word time on it. And I wanted every scene of the film somehow to be about in some way time. And of course time was especially significant to someone like Stephen who had been given two years to live. So you see the repetition of this theme verbally, lyrically, um, and even we came up with little motifs that we could thread through the film. So as time is winding, the idea of spinning of, uh, of like a circular um, universe, spiral universe, just hold it. Um, we can pause that. Yeah. Um, maybe you can take a bit for the start. <laughs> um, was, became very, very significant, so we were able to write scenes where there's a coffee cup and stirring cream into the coffee cup. When we went on location hunts, we looked for spiral staircases. And these sort of things play on a subconscious level, but they're all informing that, that, that essential concept, which is dictated in the end by the ending. Um, so uh, we can run the second clip. Um, this, is, uh, this occurs halfway through the film, and it was one of the reasons I decided to do this movie. It would have been enough, sufficient reason to want to make this film anyway because of Stephen's extraordinary achievements. But for, funnily enough, it wasn't until I got to the point in Jane's book where she started talking about this triangular relationship and the extraordinary gesture that Stephen made, generous act, to say to his wife, yes, you can take a lover, um, when he was very infirmed by that stage. And I thought, well, this is, this is now going to be a movie where the complexities of the universe are paralleled by the complexities of this relationship and it started to operate on those sort of parallel levels. So this is the first scene where Jonathan, the choir master, um, comes to have dinner for the first time and meets Steve. 
Thank you. And the third clip I'll show you is, is also towards the end. It's one of my favorite scenes in the movie, and I think it's because it's, uh, it's probably one of the most economical scenes I've ever written. It has 75 words in it, and it goes from a moment of marital triumph to a moment where they're of marital dissolution um, with only 75 words. An enormous amount of work has to be done by the actors and their faces and their hesitations and their looks. and and so forth. So we can run this one. This is me in non-dialogue mode. <laughs> the, um, the, the snot was not CGI. That was real emotion. And one of the great things about working in this business is being able to stand on a set a few feet away from these incredible actors delivering in real time that entire scene. They did it over and over about eight times and they played the entire scene at length and gave that emotion every single time. And it's, a, it's an extraordinary business that we're in and you can sit and observe that, um, that kind of thing. Finally, let me close with this. When is it fun to be a writer? When you forget everything, the hours slip by. When you travel in your chair through centuries and you seem to see everything laid out before you, everything you need. When your thoughts are caught up in the story, dallying with the details or following the course of the plot. When you enter into characters so that it seems as if, you were, uh, as if it were your own heart beating beneath their costumes. If this sounds a little pompous, it's a description by Flaubert. It's fun to be a writer when you feel you have revealed the inner nature of something that no one has quite seen before. I said that. <laughs> there was a young man from Hibernia <laughs> who rhymed himself into a hernia. He became quite adept at rhyming except you fill in the blank. Thank you very much. Good luck. May you all earn your living by doing what you love. Take risks and dare to fail. Thank you. Oh. I think we're done, are we? If anyone has any questions, I doubt it, but you may do. But uh, we, we're kind of done time-wise, aren't we? We've got a little bit of time, but time just for a few questions, because I'm sure there will be a few questions from the audience. Uh, because this is a written presentation, can you talk us through your process of writing this? Um, Yesterday like, afternoon. <laughs> Morning and afternoon, sitting in the uh, cafe here at the hotel. Is there any uh, connection between how this process works and how you normally work? Mm, it's similarly seat of the pants. It's uh, <laughs> make it, you know. Yeah, I knew the ending. <laughs> couldn't have written it if I didn't know the ending, right? Oh, I could have, but it wouldn't have been any good. As a, as a writer, you know, writer Yeah. One of the good things about getting older is you get more of a grip on your ego. You start to learn what you're best at and what you're, you know, you can, you're faking it a little. Um, I'm, you know, probably a little late realized that I'm best at doing the writing side of it. I did direct two feature films and I'm okay at it, but I'm not great. And I, you know, to learn the knowledge required to be a great director, um, as I've just explained it, um, to grow my hippocampus or whatever, you know, it's, I, life's too short. So I'm, right now, I'm just very, very focused on doing what I think I do best. So did the script capture what you had imagined? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, actually, this film was close to anything I've, you know, there's always this sort of dis, dis, dislocation between what you're seeing and what you imagined when you wrote it, but I don't know, there's something about this film um, from the very first moment of it, you know, um, where they were delivering it and then adding something. 
you know, and, and that last scene, for example, you know, they, they came in, they provided so much emotion. It, there was emotion on the page, but it wasn't that much emotion. And they were going through difficulties in their own love lives, it turned out, and they brought it to the set that day. And it, Eddie's face was just streaming with tears, take after take. He was really going through something, channeling something, and, 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 he, and that just lifted Felicity up, and she, they delivered these really quite powerhouse performances. No, no. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a known um, term. It's, it's an alternate name for the unification theory of trying to find a sort of a middle ground between general relativity and quantum mechanics. And they have yet to find one. It's elusive. It's, uh, yeah. Um, well, I don't start unless I know it. Oh, yeah. No. You don't go and write like a certain number of words no. a day to keep the process going? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried that early on and I got lost and depressed. <laughs> and I, I was either quit or come up with another approach. And I came up with another approach and it works for me. It's been working better and better the more, the more I work at it. Huh? Do I what? Yeah, I, I've been known to walk. <laughs> <laughs> I walk for you now. Here we go. I'm working for you now. I can dance. I, I could moonwalk for you. Um, no, I, I, I have a thing and it's become a little bit obsessive compulsive and it's tea drinking. And I don't even necessarily need to drink the tea, but I go to the kitchen and I plug in the kettle. And then I pour the tea and I go back to the desk and realize there's already three cups of tea already there. <laughs> and it's not necessary that I drink it, but it's just one of these sort of rituals you fall into and stuff when you spend too much time on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's, a, it's a big question. It's a, it's, that's another hour lecture on its own, I think. It's, um, it's, it's very much to do with, um, you know, a lot of people um, make the mistake of, of um, you know, not changing enough. And, and the film is inert. And who wants that? Um, but you also have to work within certain limits, hard lines of... Poetic license can only extend so far. One big no-no is you, sh you must not distort a, a living character. But you can put words into their mouth. For example, 95% of what they say and do in this movie is invented by me. And it was enormously nerve-wracking for me when we finally, Stephen Hawking came to watch the first screening. And we, we screened it in London and we got him into a seat with great difficulty. We had to pick up his wheelchair and put it there. And Eddie Redmayne said, I hope you enjoy it, Professor. Um, and he just, t his voice came out and said, I will let you know what I think, good or otherwise. <laughs> and Eddie quipped, I hope it's otherwise, Professor. And he sat there, and at the end of the movie, he had tears streaming down his cheeks. And he said, what did he say? He, he, his voice said, broadly true. <laughs> And he owned it, and, his, and Jane Hawking finally said, she starts to believe that all the scenes I invented actually happened. <laughs> so uh, truth is a, is a, you know, it's not a fixed thing, and there is, what you're looking for is authenticity. It's gotta be true to the spirit of who they are, and you, can, and you need and must change things and make it work. Yeah. Um, the first question, um, to find the director, he was known to us, he'd won an Oscar already. Um, funders were excited about him. 
that was important. Um, and we sent it to him. He wasn't the first choice director, um, but uh, we, we were delighted when he jump, jumped in and with, with his name attached, a project that had been lying around for a long time, suddenly it was a go project. We then went to work in title and said, we have James Marsh directing and we had Michael Fassbender playing, uh, playing uh, Stephen Hawking and Emily Blunt was going to play, which they weren't, but we said it anyway. Um, <laughs> And uh, we sent the script into Eric Fellner, who's the head of working title, and seven hours later got an email back saying everyone's here, everyone here at the company has read it already, come in for a meeting. And they fully funded with Universal the whole project. Um, why? James Marsh. You can't underestimate the importance of attaching a, 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 you know, a, a hot director to your project and what that does. It's totally transformative. Um, pretty much, the, well, I couldn't tell you the drafts, the number of drafts. Um, they were just endless. But they're not... We made changes. There's no such thing as perfection, no. To quote W.H. Auden, you know, poems are never finished, they're only ever abandoned. And it's similar with script writing. Oh, they'll make space. They'll, they'll, they'll make space. You don't have to leave any. Um, you want to make it as tight as possible before they come in because they all want to put their you know, fingerprints all over it. But he was very, very sensitive to the story. And the changes we made were more about creating efficiencies in the script. So making two scenes one scene so that he could have more time with the actors, which is critical. It's, it's all, time is the most... Time is the, is the big thing. Yeah. Did I? Yes, we did. Um, I was speaking to earlier this morning um, on a panel. Um, Eddie came back super excited one day because he'd spent some time with, with uh, Stephen. And he came back and said, oh, it's really great news. I, Stephen, at the end of, um, of, a, of a certain period of, uh, in his life, couldn't be understood. He was, his voice was indiscernible. He was slurring too much. And I'm going there. So I really want to just not be able to understand the dialogue at all. You know, just like that, and James Marsh said that I think that's a terrific idea, that we don't understand any of Anthony's dialogue. <laughs> and uh, so I had to then come up with a, a, a way to save that, and we came up with Jane always knowing um, what he, he was saying, and she being the only one. So it, it reinforced her, her importance in his life. We saw a little moment of that in that dinner party speech. Yeah. Um, yeah, perhaps I was a playwright, so I was very dialogue driven early on, and I'm more and more exploring silence and, and, and learning to give more to the actors. Um, it's not so showboaty, so it's, you know, so you give up a little bit of the stage to someone else. Um, something Aaron Sorkin hasn't learned to do yet, but, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it makes for more emotional storytelling. Um, it really does, because the actors are going to deliver such stuff just through, you know, pure, just eyes and voice and essence. And The, I think the guiding principle is, a, is if no one's talking, there better be a lot going on under the surface, you know, if no one's doing something. So it has to be an enormous amount of um, information being transferred non-verbally. Silence in itself is, is the dullest thing you could possibly have. So, um, you know, nobody wants to watch trees waving in a breeze, and, you know. Put it this way, you have to... You have to earn that silence, you know, at every moment. Yeah. Yeah. We'll earn the silence. Take one moment, please.
to thank the sponsors of this session, South Pacific Pictures and ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much our guests.